one page turn away. Number 30, give thanks. Facebook audience. Um, will you join me now in our opening prayer? Gracious God, you come to us again and again, no matter how late it is in the day or, or in our lives. Call us to us, gather us, you give us your good work to do, daily bread and boundless grace. Increase in us a gracious spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. We celebrate your salvation not only in our lives but also in the lives of other people. Even those we had not imagined would be included in the kingdom you are bringing. Align us with your ways and, and help, help us receive your gifts of justice Jesus, and, mercy and mercy as good news. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Whether we have much or only a little, we can share our daily bread so that all will be fed. As we have received, so now we give in the vineyards of the Lord our tithes and offerings. Thank you.
Will you please rise if able, and we will sing the doxology found on page 95. to be counted among those whom you have called. Grace to have been given your work to do. Blessed to receive more than we will ever earn. Accept, we pray, our thanksgiving and offerings and do what you choose with whatever belongs to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Welcome again, everyone, to Stony Creek United Methodist Church for the 17th, 17th Sunday after Pentecost. A um, couple quick announcements. Uh, we do have an SPRC meeting on Wednesday, and church council was moved to this coming Thursday. Um, if you have any questions about any of that, please let me know. Also, our charge conference for the leadership was moved from the 3rd of October to the 16th. Uh, they'll still be over Zoom, um, and again, if you have any questions about any of that, please let me know. But right now, I'd like to invite our children and youth to come hang out with me for a few minutes. We have a cat. One day, what did you do to your arm? How did you break your arm? <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good, yeah? So when you guys go to Sunday School and Kids Club in a little bit, I think you're going to learn about some stuff from Genesis, but I wanted to talk to you about a different story. Do you guys remember the story of Jonah and the whale? No. So Jonah was a prophet, and God wanted him to go tell a big city that they needed to start being better because they were being very mean to each other. They were doing all kinds of bad stuff. But Jonah didn't want to go, and so Jonah tried to run away. And he got on a boat and went to a sit, tried to go to a city called Tarshish. Say that 10 times fast, it's fun. So, <laughs> exactly. So God made the ocean and the sea get all crazy, and Jonah ended up going overboard, and then the sea calmed down. But then a big fish, could have been a whale, we're not, we're not totally sure, but this big fish came up, and swallowed him, but he didn't die. He stayed alive in that fish for three days, and he prayed to God. He said, I'm sorry. I will do what you ask me to do. Please let me go, and after three days, the fish bit him out, and he finally went to where he was supposed to go, called Nineveh, and he got there, and he told the people what God said, that they needed to be better and stop being so mean and nasty. And they changed their way. And so God spared them, because God was going to destroy the city if they weren't going to be good. Do you think Jonah was happy? You'd think so, right? Jonah was mad. Jonah wanted to see the city destroyed. He thought they didn't deserve to be forgiven. Jonah wasn't, wasn't very nice sometimes. But God tried to convince him that he was wrong. And the best thing about that story is that no matter what, even when we 
do something wrong, if we hurt somebody, if we make a mistake, God still loves us and God won't give up on us. Even if other people are still mad or if other people think we should be punished in maybe a worse way than we were, God is still by our side and God still wants us to be the best us we can be. I think that's pretty good, don't you? Yeah? Maybe? You're not sure? I think it's pretty good. All right. Can we do a quick repeat after me prayer? Yeah. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for your love, for your, love your, grace, your grace, and your mercy. And your Help, us Help us to show those to other people all over the world. All over the world. Amen. Amen. Awesome. You guys did great. We got one more quick thing to do. Who knows what it is? Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. You're right. You guys ready? We got we to gotta lead the congregation. They forget the word sometimes. I don't know. All right. That's why I did this and they can't care. All right. You ready? <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You guys are rock stars. You can come and have a sucker if you want one, and then you can head off. We'll see. It's going to take a while to get that empty. We'll see. Which one do you want? Oh, that's a good choice. All right, and if the rest of you would join me in our first hymn number 694, Come Ye Thankful People Come.
be seated. Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that weigh upon our hearts and our minds, as well as those things that give us cause for celebration. Do we have any joys or concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Uh, we had two joys this week. On Tuesday, Nick had a birthday. He turned 35. I don't know if you want me to tell that. Um, and Kim has a birthday today. She's 26, and I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go visit her on Mackin Island. I'm asking for prayers for my cousin. Becky, husband, very suddenly, very unexpectedly, um, and I will be going to Indiana next Sunday to go to his memorial, so I ask for travel mercies as I venture out by myself to Indiana. Thank you very much. Well, I have a joy. Uh, I start a new job, hopefully on Tuesday, so I'm going from trucking to trash. Uh, I'll be a janitor at EMU, so we'll uh, go from there. So appreciate the prayers and all that. Thank you. Any others? I do want to add one thing I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, prayers and thoughts and, and help um, with the, the fun we've had in the basement of the parsonage. Um, most of the work, cleanup stuff is done, just a few more things to take care of and um, start trying to get life back to normal. So thank you for um, all of you who have, again, been praying for us and uh, for those who were able to jump in and help um, in the midst of what was a little chaotic. Um, if you would please turn in your black hymnals uh, to number 2164, Sanctuary, for our invitation to prayer. join me in an attitude of prayer. God of unending mercy and steadfast love, we are grateful that you are slow to anger, for there is much in this world that is wrong and set against your purposes. Overcome our many injustices with your justice. Overtake our lust for revenge with your great mercy. We pray for nations locked in anemone, to be set free from old patterns and to embrace a new way of relating. We pray for people who wield economic power to take notice of those whom you notice and to have compassion for those who are vulnerable. We pray for day laborers and the unemployed and the homeless. Inspire us who have enough to share what we have, not in measured and resentful amounts, but gladly, abundantly, so basic needs do not go unattended. Gather up the first and the last, the least and the greatest, in the common work of your kingdom, until there is no more first or last at all, for all are one in your name. Help us to see not only your grace at work in the world, but also your humor at work among us, the holy laughter that heals us and helps us see ourselves rightly. 
We give you thanks, O Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate birthdays for Nick and Kim for another year on this crea- in, in your creation. We thank you for those who have been able to secure work. We pray that that work will be fulfilling, not just in meeting needs, but also in the day to day. We also lift up to you the things that weigh heavily upon us though, and this morning we'd like to lift up Becky and all of her family as she recently lost her husband unexpectedly. May your Holy Spirit surround that family, give them strength through what is going to be a difficult time, help them to know there is no right way to mourn, we all do it in our own time and our own ways. We ask that you would also watch over Fonda as she will be traveling for his memorial service in the coming days. May she arrive safely and then return home to us safely again. May her time there with her family be one, not just to share in the grieving and mourning, but may it also be a time to remember wonderful memories. We thank you, O God, for the privilege of believing in Christ, of living in Christ, and of living for Christ. In all things, at all times, we give thanks to you who never lets us go through Jesus Christ, our Savior, Amen. And if you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come and find us today, wherever we are, however we are, by the power of your Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom and that which is exacting in us to broaden until we see as you see and thereby glimpse the kingdom you are bringing in christ's name we pray amen Our first scripture this morning is from Psalms, Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. Psalms is the longest book of the Bible. It contains 150 verses. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commands your work to the others. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They elaborate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. This is the word of our Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now will you please rise if able to sing our hymn, All Who Hunger, in the black hymnal, page 2126.
be seated. Our second reading this morning can be found beginning on page 917 in the Bibles and the pews. We are in, starting in the third chapter of Jonah with the last verse, number 10, and then continuing to the 11th verse in chapter 4. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. The Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the, their left, and also many animals? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. Forgiving and restoring God, you seek reconciliation with us even when we continue to run away and to stumble and to fall. You do not want our demise, but instead our rebirth and our healing. You want us to live into the people you have intended us to become. Give us the strength through the power of your Holy Spirit to seek that same redemption for and reconciliation with those who we may see as our enemies. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning once again to you all. This is the second week of our sermon, uh, sermon series for September, titled Learning to Love Our Enemies. And the goal of this series is to, to try to offer some practical guidance to help equip all of us in working to practice that, that enemy love that Jesus preached about and continues to encourage us towards. It can be hard to find it within ourselves to forgive someone who has wronged us, let alone try to love them. And it can be incredibly challenging at times to believe in love's ability to overcome all obstacles. And furthermore, it's much easier to believe that love can overcome all obstacles when it's in relationship to something that is further away from us, not something right in front of us that we're maybe still working to process. And again, as I said last week, it is crucial for us to name and recognize that our own ability to overcome conflict within ourselves and find peace, that is still an incredible opportunity for us to reflect to others and really the entire world that unconditional love of Jesus Christ that unconditional love that continues to flow all around us to envelop us and to unite us as children of God. And it's an unconditional love that continues to be shown and given to us over and over again, despite the ways that we have stumbled or failed. 
Jesus calls us to love our neighbors and specifically calls us to love our enemies. He never said it would be easy or simple. And it was incredibly counter to the culture of that day. And yet, it still seems to be counter to our culture even now. But nonetheless, that is what we have been called to do. As crazy as it may sound, we have been called to love our enemies. Now, the first two sermons of this series, we explored how how we can respond to when others do something wrong and how God responds to when others do wrong. Today's message, though, we're going to shift directions a little bit and we're going to ask, what does God intend or desire for those who do wrong? The simple answer, of course, is that God wants them to turn from evil and to live. God wants humanity to live into the fullness of God's grace and to become the people that God has intended us to be. It may seem like an easy question, an answer about what God wants for those who do wrong, and from God's perspective, I assume it pretty much is. But what about from our perspective? Do the things that God wants align with what we want? And do our wants shift based on if we are the one whom wrong was done against or if we are merely a bystander to a wrong being done? Well, let's go back to our reading from Jonah and kind of go through what we found there. In that scripture reading that I gave you, it's a conversation between God and Jonah. And God is trying to help Jonah shift his perspective. Revenge, just desserts, and comeuppance are all the failed goals of Jonah. Our reading reveals that Jonah was running from God because he didn't want the Ninevites to be spared. Jonah wanted them to be punished for their sins. He wanted them to be destroyed, to be wiped from the face of the earth. Nice guy, huh? Not not portrayed that way in uh, the VeggieTales version with the asparagus, but what can you do? Although perhaps part of Jonah's problem was a false sense of superiority, or self-righteousness, and the fact that he seemed to take pleasure in the misfortune of others, at least in this situation. But again, it still accomplishes nothing. Jonah's response to God's forgiveness of Nineveh, I have to admit, it kind of makes me laugh, given what he's complaining about and what he's angry about. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, God, Take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Really? I'm almost lost for words. Like, I'm thankful I wasn't standing next to him because I'd be running worried about the lightning bolt that I would assume would be striking him. Jonah is angry because God is compassionate and gracious. He is angry angry that God is forgiving. Jonah's whining here is just so ridiculous to me that it kind of makes me laugh. Who does he think he is? He's a prophet of God, yes, but he is not God. He is not higher than God or really anyone else. Is he out of his mind? which possibly in his defense, he spent three days in some kind giant sea creature, so maybe he is, I don't know. But part of the challenge with this this topic 
is that the desire to punish others can potentially drive someone into a, a self-destructive fury, even to reject a message like this on loving our enemies. So instead of attacking this topic head on in terms of what we desire versus what God wants for someone who has done something wrong, I want to first try and help us connect to God's higher plans for redemption. And the, the primary purpose in doing that is that seeing and celebrating the possibility of redemption for all people, it usually makes it easier than for us to consider God's higher plans of redemption for just our enemies or people we believe have wronged us. So taking it to a wider view instead of a very specific, narrowed view. So to make these connections, I want to focus on two stories about people, or, or really rather characters, who experience a change of heart, much like the Ninevites. The first one comes from one of my favorite films, 1983 Star Wars Return of the Jedi, arguably the best of the original three. Now, I know many of you are probably familiar with this film, but I know there may be a few who are not, so, so bear with me here. Now, in Return of the Jedi, Darth Vader, who's one of our primary bad guys, he ends up redeeming himself towards the end of the film when he saves his son, Luke, from certain death. Now, prior to this, Darth Vader was often at the direction of the evil emperor, who's like the really, really bad guy. And Vader has been the cause of incalculable pain and suffering all over the galaxy. He has killed countless innocents, including children. He has oppressed entire races and planets and really brought about suffering everywhere he has gone. But... As his son Luke tells him, there is still good in him. And Vader saves Luke from the attack by the emperor and his, his lightning hands. And Vader throws the emperor over a ledge down the shaft of the battle station's power core. Now, that really should have been enough to kill the emperor, but there's a little debate on that, and I'm going to leave it to you to watch the third set of films if you want to see where the story goes. And then, of course, you can go online and listen to all the people argue about what should have happened or what did happen. It's a lot of fun. People get very passionate about things. Now, the second story I want to share with you is from arguably my favorite film of all time. And that would be 1942's award-winning Casablanca. Now, just like Return of the Jedi, I am sure that many of you are familiar with this film. But for those who are not, this is one that I cannot recommend enough for you to watch. Now, hopefully what I'm going to tell you won't spoil anything for those of you who have not seen it. And if you haven't, and you do want to see it and don't want any spoilers, and you want to run out of the sanctuary right now, or plug your ears so you can't hear anything, I totally understand. It's a really good movie. So in Casablanca, our main character, Rick Blaine, played by the amazing Humphrey Bogart, he ends up giving up his own cynicism and his own selfish interest to let Ilsa, a woman he is still deeply in love with from years ago, join her husband, Victor, in their escape to support the resistance during World War II. There is a point in the story, though, where Rick was actually planning to let Victor take the fall and get caught by the Nazis so that Rick and Ilsa could escape and be together and reignite, relive into their romance they once had. But he has that change of heart. And instead, he helps this woman that he dearly, dearly loves and also helps the wartime effort against the Nazis, a, a situation he had sworn off having any involvement in. He wanted to be left alone 
and to stay out of it. And instead, he finds himself almost in, in the exact middle of it. And then one of the other characters, Captain uh, Louis Renault, who was a corrupt official and something of a Nazi sympathizer, he too has a change of heart. And he ends up helping Rick in the end so that Victor and Ilsa can escape and so that Rick wouldn't be held accountable for their escape and suffer a grim punishment at the hands of the Nazis. Captain Renault even ponders joining the resistance himself. And that's really a significant change of heart because if he would have in fact done that, joined the resistance against the Nazis, he would be pu putting his position in life in serious, serious danger as well as those of his friends and colleagues. He would be giving up a relatively cushy position and kind of guaranteed lifestyle to do something that would potentially, almost certainly, end in his death. Now, there's actually one more story I want to share with you, but, but this one is actually from real life. This is not from a film. And this is the story of Walt Everts and Michael Carlucci. Now, Walt Evert was a pastor in the United Methodist Church. So, he's our good guy in this story. In 1987, Michael Carlucci murdered Everett's son, Scott. Now, it's hard enough to lose a child to an accident or natural causes. I can't even begin to imagine the level of pain and suffering you go through if your child is murdered. Now, now, the loss of his son, Scott, almost destroyed Everett's life completely until he was able to forgive Michael Carlucci. And not only did he forgive him, but Everett even helped to secure Carlucci's early release from prison. He officiated at Carlucci's wedding and he worked with Carlucci to speak at schools and churches about how decisions affect lives. So in this instance, Carlucci wasn't necessarily the one who had a change of heart, although I would imagine at some level there was some change if you go from murdering someone to kind of turning your life around. But Everts here had a change of heart. He would have had every right, based on, I think, most people's feelings, to want to see Carlucci suffer the way that he suffered. And he probably did for a while. That's probably what was causing his life to fall apart, holding in that anger, that frustration, that pain. But when he found himself able to forgive him, when he himself had that change of heart, everything changed. I hope that, that you can begin to see the power of redemption and the second chances and, and how it all connects with, with personal values of hope and devotion. I hope that you can see the integration of the concept of God not wanting punishment or death, but instead God wanting people to be redeemed that they turn from evil ways and that they live. The good news here is that God actively works to lead everyone, including all of us, from, from self-destructive and harmful paths back to righteousness and vitality. Our God is a God of second chances. For that matter, our God is a God of third and fourth and fifth and so on, chances. It's no wonder where Jesus got the idea to tell the disciples you should forgive your brothers not seven times, but 70, or seven times, 77, and, and so on. It's a common theme in the Trinity. God will do whatever it takes to touch our hearts and make us whole. God doesn't want suffering. 
God does not want destruction and pain. God wants reconciliation. God wants people to thrive, to be the best them that they can be. Even when we might think that someone's getting off too easy, or maybe someone's done something, whether it was to us or to someone else, that just is unforgivable. Thank God that's not our decision to make. And thank God that we have a God of forgiveness and unconditional love. When we step back and look at all of this, I hope that we can realize that we too can trust in God's love for us, all of us, including those we see as our enemies. It's the basis of the good news. God loves us enough to forgive us, and God wants to be in relationship with us. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able for our closing hymn number 438, Fourth in Thy Name, O Lord. beloved children of God, the gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable. God has gifted you with forgiveness and graced you with reconciliation. Go now and share God's gift with the distressed and the estranged. Christ has called you close to him and healed you from torment. Go now and call others to receive Christ's mercy and healing. And now may the God who forgives, reconciles, heals, and blesses is with you today and forevermore. Go, serve the Lord, love all, even your enemies. Amen.